Right, hello everyone and welcome to the Diesel Arsenal YouTube channel and tonight it's me, I, it's not Diesel tonight, you've got me and I'm going to be talking to you about what caused the death of Mars, um, absolutely fascinating story, one of my personal favourites, so I hope you're going to enjoy it because it's a really, really interesting story. But I think so anyway, and I hope that you will enjoy it. Um, so we've already got one person in the chat, um, Narenda Modi. She says, was, or he says, was Mark Mars Olive to begin with? Who knows? A manned mission would be the only way to prove it. 100%, mate. I have to be honest, I had never heard about it being Olive before. Um, we are going to, I am going to talk about the early history of Mars and things like that. Um, but yeah, I've, I've not heard that one before. That's an interesting one, definitely. Anyway, so what am I going to talk about? So what I'm going to talk about um, is, you can see here on the screen, um, is... Is Earth the only planet that has ever been capable of hosting life? What is the Goldilocks zone? Um, introducing Do Dr. John E. Brandenburg and his theory about Mars. Um, John E. Brandenburg's PhD paper. Approximate locations on Mars of the nuclear explosions. The nuclear explosions on Mars. The anonymous structures on Mars, ET's contact, uh, sorry, Earth's contact with ET. How can we defend ourselves if we need to? Where did we come from? The Mars and ancient Egypt connection, Fermi's paradox, and then my thoughts on the subject. So that's all the different topics that I'm going to speak to you about tonight. Um, I hope that's going to be interesting for everyone and. Let's see what happens. So before we get started, people, please make sure you subscribe to Diesel's channel. Please make sure you put a like on this video for him. And also, please um, make sure you share the content around. Make sure you pass it on to other people as well. Let them see it too. And also, while you're at it, please subscribe to my channel and my channel is called Warren's Team Talk. And you can find me on Instagram. You can find me on Twitter and on YouTube. And um, you just do a search for me, Warren's Team Talk. It's, that's all it is. I've not got any numbers or fancy bits and bobs with it as well. So just that. Um, so... Let's get into it. Um, Mars dead, Mars's deadly secret. Well, about 180 million years ago, it is alleged that our solar system had a giant planet between Mars and Jupiter, which Mars was a moon for, and that both Mars and this fifth planet were both watery planets with humanoid civilizations living on them. And... Um, we can see here, this is an artist's impressions of the mythical giant Planet 5 and its satellite, Mars. So, obviously, um, Mars is the smaller of the two of them. Um, it was, it's claimed that, um, that this um, fifth planet was um, destroyed in uh, ancient galactic war. And the asteroid belt is what is left of this mythical fifth planet. Um, so, however, mainstream science claims that the asteroid belt was formed as a result of unused materials and stroke rocks when the solar system was formed. Now, um, it is alleged that around 180 million years ago, Mars was a watery, watery planet which had a humanoid civilization living on it, and it suffered a massive attack as the mythical fifth planet had done, rendering it uninhabitable. So this is what scientists think that may, Mars may have looked at, looked like about 180-odd million years ago. 
Um, so as you can see, there is it, it's got a lot of water and it looks a bit like Earth, to be quite honest. Um, so the question is, how did it end up being a lifeless planet incapable of sustaining life as it is now, if it was like we've just seen there um, originally? So NASA has... NASA has admitted that throughout history, Venus, Earth and Mars have had all had atmospheres capable of sustaining life. And yes, Venus and Mars are not capable of sustaining life now, but that doesn't mean that they weren't able to do so in the past. So there is a term in science called the Goldilocks zone. Now, the Goldilocks zone, if we look at this here, this is slide here, it explains the Goldilocks zone. Part of the hunt for water on other worlds means looking for planets, obtaining, orbiting a certain distance from their stars. Planets in this zone are neither too hot nor too cold, and conditions could be just right for liquid water. So, basically, there's an optimum area of the of a uh, star's solar system, if it's got a system of planets around it, where planets are able to have water because they're not too cold and they're not too hot. If they're too cold, there'd be ice. And if they're too hot, then the water will evaporate. So Joanne has appeared in the chat. She's saying, hello, Warren. Uh, hi, Joanne. I hope you're well. Lovely to see you. Um, so this explains the Goldilocks zone as well. So basically, the Goldilocks zone is that area of the solar system which is far enough from its sun not to be too hot and not to be too far as to be too cold so that all necessary ingredients for life could thrive, such as liquid water. So that's the um, Goldilocks zone. And here we can see it... If in the first bit, in the red bit, where it's too hot, it means the water evaporates. In the green bit, it's perfect, so there's just liquid water. And in the blue bit, it's um, where the water would turn to ice. And, yeah, so the, you can see that there. That shows it quite well. Don't forget, everyone, please subscribe to Diesel Arsenal. This is this channel. If you haven't done it already, that would be absolutely fantastic. And also, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel, Warren's Team Talk. And also, please don't forget to put likes on both our channels uh, video, um, and all the videos on our channels. And also, don't forget to share the content around. That would be absolutely brilliant if you could do that for us. Because we're not asking you to pay for this. It's completely free. So, yeah, if you could just do that, that would be absolutely brilliant. So... Um, over the course of time, the location of the Goldilocks zone changes depending on the size of the solar system's sun, which means obviously the solar system's planets will move in and out of the Goldilocks zone over the lifetime of the solar system. So this basically, I'm going to show you what happens now. So in the go in this particular slide here you can see the goldilocks zone in our solar system as it currently is the green and the green area that you can see is the goldilocks zone for our solar system currently venus earth and mars all sit within this goldilocks zone and 180 odd million years ago the zone was in the same position as it is uh, today which means that all three planets were capable of sustaining life at that time. So the question is, what le led to a situation where now we have a, a, a scenario where our planet is the only one that has life on it and is capable of sustaining life? Um, so NASA has claimed that Venus lost its ability um, Yeah. So Venus 
NASA has claimed that Venus has lost its ability to sustain life about 700 million years ago because something called an outgassing event. Now, the an outgassing event is the release of, of a gas that was dissolved, trapped, frozen, or absorbed into material. While the exact cause of the outgassing event is still unknown, it is um, possible that it's linked to the planet's volcanic activity um, as magna and molten rock bubbled up to the planet's surface. Large amounts of carbon dioxide would have been released back into the atmosphere. So if the mag magna uh, had solidified before reaching the surface, it would have created a barrier and prevented gas from being reabsorbed. Now, similar events have occurred in, occurred in Earth's past. For example, the Siberian Traps is one of the largest known volcanic events in the last 500 million years. This event released toxic amounts of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere and caused a mass extinction. Um, now, Earth has managed to survive, but it has also had several near misses the most famous of these near misses was the meteorite impact, which caused the mass extinction of the dinosaurs on this planet circa 65 million years ago. And this is not the only occasion where there have been impacts on our planet. One of the most recent of which is alleged caused the Earth to shift on its axis and bring about the end of the last ice age and huge global flooding. Um, a guy by the name of Graham Hancock has done some incredible, has some incredible theories about this, which I'm hoping to cover in a future show on uh, Diesel's channel for you because it is incredible. At these theories are absolutely incredible. There was also the Tung the Ta Tunguska event. Now this happened at the beginning of the last century in Russia when a 50 to 60 meter asteroid exploded in the atmosphere and um, it caused absolute mayhem and devastation in the local area and flattened a huge forest. So how did Mars end up being a lifeless desert of a planet which is incapable of sustaining life? It has been claimed that Mars suffered a devastating life-ending attack by an aggressive extraterrestrial civilization roughly 180 million years ago. And it seems that this attack was centered on the Cydonia region of Mars. So there this guy here, a scientist by the name of John, Dr. John E. Brandenburg, PhD author of Death on Mars, The Discovery of a Planetary Nuclear, Ma Nuclear Massacre, has put forward a lot of interesting data and well thought out and meticulously investigated um, theory on this subject. And um, Dr. Brandenburg claims that Mars has high levels of xenon-129, as well as other radioactive isotopes, which he believes are the result of one or more massive hydrogen bombs, hydrogen bomb-like explosions in the Cydonia region. And he believes that this took place approximately 180 million years ago. And they, they were exploded above the ground so as to give maximum impact. And the fact that they were exploded above the ground would mean that they would not leave a crater. So we've got Steve RFC in the chat. He says, uh, big up, and how do you see Chelsea and Liverpool game going? Mate, I, it's difficult to say because both sides' form has been terrible, but um, it wouldn't surprise me if Chelsea don't get a win. Um, but you, you just can't tell, really, because Liverpool so up and down. But, yeah, nice to see you, Steve. I hope you're good, mate. Um, so, yeah, please, everyone, please don't forget to put a like on the video for Diesel. 
and also make sure that you subscribe to diesel's channel if you haven't done so already and also please uh, make sure you share the content around with everyone that you know and also do the same for me please subscribe to my channel warren's team talk and also please make sure that um you check out some of my videos on there and uh, things like that. That would be absolutely lovely if you could do that. <laughs> Make me really happy. So, anyway, um, Sidonia is in the northern hemisphere of Mars and its general location can be seen in the map which you are looking at now. As you can see, I put a yellow cross on there and um, the little yellow cross and the Sidonia thing. Uh, you can see it that's basically whereabouts it is on on the planet um and steve rsc has come back in saying my prediction of one one draw it wouldn't surprise me mate it would not surprise me um the f now the, let's move on so the following is an extract from a paper written by John E. Brandenburg, about this subject, which was entitled Evidence of Massive Thermonuclear Explosions on Mars in the Past, The Sidonian Hypothesis and Fermi's Paradox. I have a copy of this paper. If anyone who's watching this would like a copy of it, I'm happy to send it to you in a PDF version. Um, all you need to do is just drop me an email uh, my email address is Warren's Team Talk at Outlook.com. That's Warren's Team Talk at Outlook.com. Um, let's just see if I can go back. Yeah, so there it is there in the text at the bottom there. Uh, Warren's Team Talk. Um, if you send me an email to Warren's Team Talk at Outlook.com, I'll be more than happy to send you a copy of that paper that he wrote. Um, and so let's let's carry on. Um, what is the Fermi's paradox? So the Fermi's paradox, okay, is the unexpected silence of the cosmos under the assumption of mediocrity. The mediocrity principle is the phil philosophical notion that if an item is drawn at random from one of several sets or categories, it's more likely to come from the most numerous category than any of the less numerous ones. So the principle has been taken to suggest that there is nothing unusual about the evolution of the solar system, Earth's history, the evolution of biological complexity, um, human evolution, or any or any one nation. So, in a cosmos cosmos known to be, have abundant planets and life precursor chemicals. So, basically, they're saying that there should be uh, loads of civilizations in our galaxy, just because of the amount of um, planets and what we sh what not that there are. So on Mars, the nearest – make sure something – hold on just a sec for me. Yeah, so on Mars, the nearest um, Earth-like planet in the cosmos, the concentration of 129 Xenon – sorry, Xenon 129 – in the Martian atmosphere, the evidence uh, from 80, Krypton 80, the abundance of intense um, 1014 uh, centimetre squared flux over the north, northern young part of Mars, and the detected pattern of excess abundance of uranium and thorium on Mars's surface relative to Mars meteorites can be explained as due to two large thermonuclear explosions in the past. So 
based on the pattern of thorium and radioactive potassium gamma radiation, the explosions were centered in the northern plains in Mare uh, Acadalium at approximately 50 degrees north and 30 degrees west, west near Sidonia, Mensa, and in Utopia Planium at approximately 50 degrees north and 120 degrees west near Galaxius Chaos, both locations of possible archaeological artifacts. So the red dots that you can see on the screen there are the potential sites of the nuclear explosions. So the xenon... Um, So the xenon, um, hold on, sorry guys. So the xenon isotope mass spectrum of the Mars atmosphere matches that from an open air nuclear testing on Earth and is characteristic of fast neutron fusion, uh, fission, sorry, rather than that produced by a moderated nuclear, by a moderated nuclear reactor. The high abundance of argon-40 cannot be explained by mass fraction, fractionation during atmospheric loss and must be the result of neutron capture on Krypton-39, also requiring an intense neutron flux on the Mars surface as, as, it is, um, as is the high abundance of... Um, Deuterium and modeling the xenon-129 component in the Mars atmosphere as due to fast neutron fusion and the Krypton-80 as due to delayed neutrons from a planet-wide debris layer and assuming, and assuming an explosive disassembly of uranium-thorium casing into a planet-wide debris layer with 10% residue all three estimates arrive at approximately um, 10, 25 joule or a yield of 1,010 megatons. Um, so, with Del Boy Gunner is in the chat. Um, he's saying, hi, Warren, and big up, Diesel. Um, nice to see you, Del Boy. I hope you're good, mate. Lovely to see you, mate. Thanks for coming and joining. And... Narendra Modi said there's been a lot, uh, there's been a few probes sent to Mars. What was the outcome of their life on Mars test? I'm coming to that in a little while, um, Narendra. So I'll be talking about that in a little while. So there is a similar, this is similar to the Chicken Club event on Earth and it would be large enough to create a global catastrophe and change Mars's global climate. The Chicolub event on Earth happened 66 million years ago and was the event that occurred when a large asteroid, which was about 10 kilometers, six miles in diameter, struck the Earth. It is now widely accepted that this event was responsible for the mass extinction of 75% of plant and animal species on Earth, including 99% of all non-avian dinosaurs. It is believed that our modern-day alligators and crocodiles are remnants of that period and that the only dinosaur to serve and are the only dinosaurs that who survived the impact. The absence of craters at the sites on Mars suggests that the centres of the explosions were above the ground. The explosions appear to be due to very large fusion fission devices of similar design as seen on Earth, and the Acadalia device, the largest being approximately 80 metre radius. The explosions appear correlated with two sites of possible archaeological sites, which are the basis for the Cydonia hypothesis. The Sardonia hypothesis is therefore reconsidered in light of new imaging and geochemical data. A model of Earth-like eroded archaeology is adopted for comparison with Mars. 
artifacts using the pyramids at Giza and the Sphinx and Olmec heads as analogues under the principle of mediocrity with attention to details. So, oops. So let's move on. So the new images of the face at Sidonia Mensa confirm eyes, nose, mouth, helmet structure with additional details of nostrils and helmet and ornaments being clearly seen in new images with details that are approximately one-tenth scale of the face. New imagery confirms the pyramid structure seen in Viking images of the DNM pyramid and new high resolution images show evidence of collapse collapsed brickwork and we'll be looking at those uh, images in a little while and new images of a face found at galaxia's chaos the utopia site confirms facial structure with eyes nose mouth and helmet high resolution imagery shows symmetric brickwork around the nose region and um the civilization appears to have been primitive and indigenous to Mars. Taken together, the evidence suggests that Mars was the locale of a planetary nuclear massacre. Please note, if you'd like me to send you a copy of John Brandenburg's paper, I will send it to you all. Uh, all you need to do, like I said before, was email me uh, on the email address warrensteamtalkoutlook.com. And um, I will be discussing the Fermi's paradox in more detail later because I think the answer to the paradox lies in Marcy's ancient past. Um, and uh, I think there's a very um, simple explanation as to why the people think there's a paradox. So what other evidence is there to suggest that the Mars was once um whoops so what other evidence was there to suggest that mars was once an earth-like planet capable of sustaining life so listen guys please make sure you subscribe to diesel's channel please make sure you put a like on the video and subscribe if you haven't done so already please make sure you share this video around and to as many different people as you possibly can make sure it gets out there and gets known about also make sure you please that you do the same for my channel um which is warren's team talk please make sure you do that as well put likes on my videos please subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already and also please make sure that you do it for uh joanne smith she's got a youtube channel i know that and also to the one and the only del boy gunner tv um both of them absolute legends so please make sure you do that that would be absolutely fantastic if you could do that for them so let's move on now it has been widely accepted that the planet's surface bears clear evidence of features that appear to have been carved by flowing water, such as deltas, shorelines, rivers, and lakes. So, and um, there is also photographic evidence which was released by NASA, which appears to show fossilized remains of microbial life um, from a Martian rock, and we can see that here. Um, and the allegation is that the bit in the middle, the sort of long uh, sausage-like uh, image that you can see that's sort of hanging, looks like it's hanging down over the rock, is um, a microbial life form. Um, so, in July 2003, the Mars Odyssey orbiter detected huge amounts of ice on Mars. Humans had known that Mars had frozen ice caps um, of carbon dioxide 
But with this discovery, it was proven that Mars had frozen water too. And this was further confirmed by the Phoenix spacecraft in 2008. In, 2000 and in 2012, the Curiosity rover landed on Mars and proved beyond any doubt that liquid water had once flown, flowed on Mars. And scientists, scientists have estimated that there could have been enough water on the planet's surface to submerge the entire planet in an ocean up to a mile deep. Some scientists have claimed that the planet lost its atmosphere because it lacks a protective magnetic field and ozone layer and that much of the planet's atmosphere was stripped away by solar radiation. Water molecules in the atmosphere were destroyed, which caused a gradual reduction in pressure, which allowed the water on the surface to evaporate and escape into space. And so as pressure um so the, sorry and into space and so as pressure and the temperature dropped even further liquid and as temperature dropped even further liquid water could no longer survive on the surface for any length of time and this meant that gradually the oceans would have shrunk and receded before the remnants of um froze over forever Mars does have a magnetic field. It's not a strong one, but it does have one. And in fact, gravity on Mars is 0 0.01 of what it is on Earth. So um, there's some more chats in here. And um, Joanne saying, oh, yeah, those faces. <laughs> exactly. And they're unbelievable. For me, it's like incredible. And Naranda says... Those faces look like um, faces when seen at a certain angle. They do. They do. And um, Steve RFC says Arsenal would win 4-1 um, again as long as they keep winning. Man City can do nothing. That's true, but they've got to play Man City yet. So let's see what happens. If, if they can go to Man City and win, then... You know, that would be incredible. Clem says, big ups, Warren. What do you think of um, Musk's plan to nuke the poles on Mars to transform the... Tra sorry, to trans... What do you think of Musk's plan to nuke the poles on Mars to terraform? The man sounds a bit nutty to me, laugh out loud. Now, I remember I had a chat with someone about that, and they said to me, Warren, well, what you need to remember about Elon Musk is that he's a complete and utter nutter. And I have to say, I can't disagree with him. I mean, to go around and start, you know, dishing nukes out all over the place, I'm not sure that's the best thing to be doing, to be honest. Um, Joe insists said they remind me of Romans, them faces. Well, there you go, you see. Um, they are very... They, for me, they, they do look human. They do. And Del Boy says, Musk is an odd Paul. <laughs> he certainly is, mate. And um, Naranda says, Terraform Mars, great idea if it takes a nutty man to do it it's all good um it is as long as he doesn't like make the whole planet completely radioactive i mean there is a lot of radioactive stuff up there as it is so like adding to it i'm not sure is the best way to go if they could do it without using nukes then it would be amazing um clem says his opinions are all over the place <laughs> well yeah um He's got some interesting ideas. He certainly has. Um, that's for sure. Um, anyway, so moving on. Um, moving on. So there are also numerous other anonymous, anonymous structures on Mars which appear to have been created artificially. There are three main ones, but there are more 
and the main ones are the DNM pyramid, um, the face on Mars, and the city. We'll be looking at those individually in a little while. Um, so the face on Mars, right? This is probably the most famous of these three and appears to be a two kilometer long structure which resembles a human face with stairs straight up from the surface. It is located in the Martian, Martian Northern Hemisphere by Acadalia Plan Planetilia and Sardonia Mense. Uh, staff working at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory first noticed the face and they displayed it in a press conference. However, N NASA had later dismissed it as a trick of light and shadow. However, another vim image of the face that had been taken under different lighting conditions was found by Vincent Di Pietro and Gregory Molinar. Computer enhancement of these images revealed um, bilateral... Um, hold on, sorry. What's going on here? So, where were we? So, computer enhancement of these images revealed bilateral symmetry, detail resembling eyes, a nose, and a mouth, and persistence of this detail under two different sun angles. And subsequent work by Dr. Mark Carlotto demonstrated that the face was not a trick of light and shadow or any other misunderstanding of what was being viewed. It was clearly a three-dimensional landform and for whatever reason has the form of a human face. Enhanced image processing by Colato more clearly reveals the presence of an eye socket in the shadowed side, as well as detail in the mouth that is suggestive of teeth. Uh, I've heard someone as well saying that the image of the face shows gritty teeth, so that it's like a sort of angry face. Whether that's true or not, I don't know, because I've not seen that image, but um, that's what I heard. And again, once again, people, please don't forget to subscribe to Diesel Arsenal YouTube channel. Please make sure you do that for him. Please make sure you put a like on this video. And please make sure you can share the content around. Please do the same for me as well. Please subscribe to my channel. And please make sure that you put likes on my videos if you go and check them out. And make sure you share them around for me. That would be absolutely brilliant. Thank you, guys. And I just want to give Diesel a big up because I know some of the subjects I talk about when I come on here are a bit some people would say off key. I would say that they're interesting um, and whatever, but a lot of people would shy away from uh, talking about these subjects. But I love talking about them, I find them absolutely fascinating. And like I say, I want to give Diesel a big thank you for letting me come on there and do this for him. So, yeah, big up to Diesel and make sure you show him some support, please, people. And so, anyway, after Di Pietro and Molinar's image processing work, other, um, other land uh, forms that are inconsistent with large geology, with the local geology, were discovered. And Richard Hoagland began investigating the imagery and discovered another a number of other anonymous objects, which were later named the city. And um, we can see the city there. And that have rectilinear arrangement and a major axis aimed directly at the face. So there's some more chats in here. Let's go and check these out. Uh, Joanne says, like Julius Caesar, those faces. And Joanne says, that's great. Very fascinating, that face. Thank you, Joanne, for your kind comments. And Naranda says, great show. Thank you, Naranda. I'm glad that you're enjoying it. Um, about halfway through so far. Uh, Del Boy says, I've never heard of the Mars City. Yeah, there is. There's, um, there's a whole load of pyramids and stuff like that. 
and obviously it's not that colour. That's just done for illustration so that it makes it easier for people to see. But, yeah, there's some really interesting structures up there, mate, to be honest. Clem says, thanks for doing these, Warren. Always interesting. Good. I'm glad that you're enjoying them. It's good to hear. Thank you so much for your kind words. Um, so the face's axis of symmetry is itself perpendicular to the city city's major axis. And Hogan later demonstrated that a square arrangement of objects in the centre of the city, uh, termed the city square, marks the exact midpoint along the city's major axis and would have served as an excellent vantage point for a sight line to the face. So let's move on. And now you can see more imagery of the, the city. Uh, the top right corner, you can see the face. And then let me see if I can get this to come up. Yeah, so where is it? Where See, the DMM pyramid that they're talking about is sort of towards the left-hand side of the screen. Uh, but like I say, we'll be looking at that in more detail in a second. So this is the DMM pyramid. Now, I'm going to show you something else um, that is not a particularly great image, but um, that is it's a five-sided it's a five-sided pyramid. Most of the ones on planet Earth are four-sided or three-sided. So there. Now, as you can see, there's a lot of talk that um, by some people in some sectors that the the DNM pyramid has got an image or can easily be seen as a Matruvian man. That's why I've done those lines on it so you can see because if you look at it, it's like a, you can see like a human sort of outline across the top of the pyramid. So Di Pietro and Molinar had previously noted the presence of a massive pyramid nearly three kilometres in length and one kilometre high to the south of the city and face. Richard Hoagland, working with a higher quality image process by Stanford Research Institute, observed the object to be a five-sided bilateral symmetrical pyramid whose axis of symmetry is aimed directly at the face. The geometric re re regularity of the DNM pyramid, together with its alignment with other enigmatic landforms, has led some to speculate that the object may have an artificial origin but others discount this speculation, citing the sim likelihood of life evolving on Mars past the microbial stage and the interterminal likelihood of colonisation of Mars by civilization from elsewhere. But the question remains, if these are, are structures, if these structures are real and artificial in origin, then where did they come from, i.e. who built them and why? So, and as you can see, there's a better image here of the, the DNM pyramid, okay? So you can see the pyramid there. It's got like a, the one on the left, it's like you can quite clearly see. It looks like a, for me, it looks like a, a, a guy with his arms and leg outstretched. And then... The image on the right shows another image of the pyramid as well. So both those images for me are quite interesting. Um, and there's quite a lot of detail on them and you can see the different angles uh, built into them uh, because the guy I mentioned earlier, Hoagland, he's convinced that there's a, a reason why that the angle, they built with those angles built into them. So what happened on Mars that meant that the planet changed from being a watery Earth-like planet to the desert lifeless one it is today? Um, John. 
So some scientists have claimed that one possible explanation could be that Mars suffered a massive meteor impact, which caused its oceans to eventually dry up into red dust. But this explanation does not account for the high levels of thermonuclear radiation, which were found on Mars around 180 odd million years ago, which were, it alleged, two and a half times higher than those found on Earth at the end of World War II. So, Dr. John E. Brandenburg claims that there is evidence of large R process events having taken place on Mars around 180 million years ago. And R process events are when nuclear fusion and fission, fission processes combine and feature an intense high energy neutron bombardment or heavy elements, and phys physicists know of only two R process events. One is when a star goes supernova, i.e. it blows up, or the other is a thermonuclear explosion like we had at the end of World War II, or the latter hydrogen bomb test. So scientists have found evidence of this through rock samples, that have been brought back from Mars by unmanned missions to Mars or from meteorite samples that appear to have come from Mars. Dr. Brandenburg said that the nuclear isotopes in the Martian atmosphere are similar to those found in hydrogen bomb tests on Earth, and he believes that there were at least two airborne nuclear, airborne nuclear explosions upwind from two places in the Martian Northern Hemisphere, which were Cydonia Mensa and Galaxias Chaos, where excess Xenon-129 is found and Krypton-80 is found in some rocks. And in both of the alleged nuclear bomb blast sites, uh, Trinitite is also found. So, Trinitite. This is an image of Trinitite. Trinitite is, to, is known to be associated with the melting of sand and nuclear bomb sites. And it has been found at both sites and it has also been found at the New Mexico White Sands 1945 atomic bomb test sites. This green crystal, Trinitite, is formed after sand is scooped up into the atomic fireball and liquefied liquidifies in the intense heat and then falls back into the hot sand where it can form into um, the green chunks of glassy, glassy metal melted sand that you can see in the image. Dr. Brandenburg claims that the green trinitite glass has been found by an orbiter above the Martian Cydonia region. As well as this, a meteorite was found in 1979 in Antarctica that scientists believe came from Mars and shows on one side signs of intense neutron bombardment, including trapped gas bubbles of xenon-129 and argon-40 and krypton-80. And Dr. Brandenburg concluded after examining the rock that the events that had transpired to cause this intense neutron bombardment had occurred 180 million years ago on Mars. So, here we go. So, guys, please make sure you uh, put a like on the video. Um, please make sure you subscribe to the main man, Diesel's um, channel, if you haven't done so already. He does lots of brilliant stuff on here. He talks about football. He talks about life in general. He has me coming on doing this paranormal stuff for him every now and again. He also uh, talks about life in general and TV, all sorts of different things. It's not just limited to Arsenal and to football. So, do yourself a favour, and if you haven't done so already, and subscribe to his channel. It's a brilliant, brilliant channel, and he does brilliant, brilliant shows on here. When he comes on here and speaks, it is just incredible. It really is 
And also, please make sure you do the same for me. Um, make sure you come and check out my channel, Warren's Team Talk. Please make sure you put a like on any of the videos there that you watch. My channel is more to do with um, football and sports. I don't talk about this stuff on, on there. I leave that for when I come into Diesel's channel. But both of them are big passions of mine. So, um, yeah, please make sure you do that for us and um, make sure that you share the content around as well. That would be brilliant. So let's uh, get back into the chat. Um, let's see. Clem says, thanks. Oh, I read that one. And Joanne says, it looks like a stick man. Good. That's what I wanted to see. Because it's supposed to be the Metruvian man. You know, the thing, the, like these years ago, there was this TV program. And they, the theme music for the show was called the, it was the Age of Aquarius, I think. Oh, I might be mistaken because it's been such a long time ago. And now Kane's in the chat. He says, big ups. Same to you, Now, Lovely to see you, mate. I hope you're well. And... Um, as well as the high neutron uh, radiation levels found on Mars, there is also the huge five-sided pyramid known as the DNM pyramid, which is one of the is one kilometer high and three kilometers long. I mean, that's massive, isn't it? <laughs> kilometer high. And five, uh, three kilom kilom kilometers long. That's just madness. It really is. Um, why does it keep doing that? It's really annoying me now. Um, right, so let's leave that there. And then there is, then 15 kilometers from the DNM pyramid, we have a group of anon anonymous structures known as the city. And in the other direction, there is the famous face on Mars. The face is one kilometre wide, and from chin to helmet is 1.5 kilometre, kilometre, 1.5 kilometres long, and from the ground to the tip of its top of its nose is 0.5 kilometres high. So, in comparison, the Sphinx of Egypt measures 73 metres. That's 240 foot long. It's 19 metres, 62 feet wide and 20 metres, 66 feet high. So you can see it's a lot, lot bigger. Um, but this is not the only evidence that has been discovered. These include the abundance of Krypton 80 in young Martian meteorites, as well as the high levels of Argon 40, that can only possibly come from an R process event, which, as we saw earlier, can only occur from a star going supernova, i.e. blowing up, or from a thermonuclear explosion, which took place on Mars 180 million years ago. So the big question then is what happened and why? So Dr. Brandenburg believes that Mars suffered a nuclear holocaust, but what caused this is, un is unknown. But he believes that there are at least two massive nuclear blasts, which he believes were in the region of billions of megatons, and that they were detonated kilometres above the surface, just as they had been in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and were just as on Mars there is no craters. Allegedly, by detonating the bombs above the surface in this way, it would maximise the shock waves from the blast. And Dr. Brandenburg took the data, uh, isotopic evidence that he was able to find, and showed it to nuclear weapons experts who agreed that it looked like it was clear evidence of huge nuclear weapons being used. Dr. Brandenburg has said that he has found scientific literature showing that Xenon-129 spikes occur in the core of a supernova 
which they were able to ascertain by undertaking simulations of a supernova and xenon-129 spikes also occur in hydrogen bombs. He was also, also able to ascertain that Mars' surface was heavily bombarded by neutrons at the same time as the event which caused the xenon-129 and that the Martian atmosphere had much higher levels of argon-40 in its atmosphere than Earth did, and that this happened at the same time as the nuclear bomb blasts. So what happens, apparently, when a nuclear bomb is detonated is that it releases neutrons into the air, and these combine with the nitrogen in the air, and they release very deadly, ga deadly gamma rays. And then the air absorbs the, absorbs the neutrons from the bomb and then radiates gamma rays because of the nitrogen-14, absorbing a neutron and turning it into a nitrogen-15 and emitting a gamma ray in the process, which are extremely deadly. And this leads to the air around human beings being a source of radiation due to the neutrons in the nitrogen and all this, he claims, also happened on Mars, as there is much more nitrogen-15 in proportion to nitrogen-14 on Mars than there is in the Earth's atmosphere. So let's quickly get into the chat, because Randy Viper has kindly made a donation um, to the Diesel Arsenal channel of $2.20 New Zealand, two uh two new zealand dollars 20 Warren, my brother my cousin my mate my, my man thank you very much uh randy that's very kind of you um i'm sure diesel will be absolutely delighted with that and thank you very very much for making that donation that's very kind of you um so dr brandenburg has as a consequence of his studies has come to conclusion that Mars had a civilization on Earth. On Mars had a civilization on it which was humanoid and looked potentially like early kingdom Egyptian or Mayan. And it seems likely that another extraterrestrial group arrived and decided to destroy the Martian civilization and the planet's entire biosphere so that the civilization could never recover. So, now, we're going to talk now about Oumuamua and the ancient builder race. So, we're going to leave the science, we're going to cut, we're going to cut down a bit on the science now. Um, we're still going to talk about it, but not as detailed as I've just done. But it was important I did that because it's like, does add a lot of weight to the story. It's also been claimed that there was an ancient builder race which was responsible for creating, developing, and protecting civilizations throughout the cosmos, including our own. It's certainly a fact that human civilization made a huge jump forward about 60,000 years ago, and that no one has a clue as to why this happened. And this was after millions of years of no major noticeable development. It's been estimated that the ancient builder race is approximately 2 billion years old, and this leads me on to the Muamua story. On the 19th of October 2017, the first interstellar object to visit our solar system was discovered by the University of Hawaii, and interestingly, it was originally designated as a comet. However, it was later, later it was found that it did not exhibit signs of any comet-like activity. And curiously, after it slingshotted past our sun at a speed of approximately 196,000 miles an hour, 87.3 kilometers per second, it seemed to speed up. Um, also, initially, when it was first seen, it was classified as an asteroid but when it was found that it was accelerating slightly 
one possible explanation was that it was a comet. However, given the object's strange and unusual behaviour, many have claimed that it was an alien probe, as it is claimed that it as as it is claimed that as it was leaving our solar system, it started to increase in speed. Now, I don't know about any of you lot, right? But I have to say, I'm not aware of any inanimate object or any meteorite or asteroid that is capable of changing direction and or increasing or decreasing its speed. Uh, I just don't know. I mean, if any of you do know of any such objects, please throw it in the chat because I'd like to know. Um, anyway, so whatever it was, it certainly displayed some highly strange and inexplicable behaviour. So much so that one of the world's current uh, theoret leading uh, theoretical physicists who works on astrophysics and cosmology at Harvard University has gone on record as saying that there was probably there was a probability that it was an alien probe. And then on the 26th of January 2021, Avi Loeb, who is uh, an who is an a theoretical physicist published a book entitled Extraterrestrial, The First Sign of Intelligent Life Beyond Earth, in which he discusses that a Muamua might be an alien probe. Um, so it is also a fact that in the 1970s, the United States, Pioneer 10 and 11, and had plaques on them, giving information about us as a species and also the golden records that were sent on the Voyager 1 and 2 probes um, did the same. They also gave a star map of the location of our planet and the universe. So those things, like I say, went up in the 70s, so that would be about near on 50 years ago now, I guess. So please, guys, make sure you subscribe to Diesel's uh, YouTube channel if you haven't done it already. Please make sure you put a like on this video and subscribe to his channel. Please make sure you do the same for me. And please make sure you subscribe to my channel and also hit the like button, like button on any videos that you watch. That would be very, very much appreciated. Thank you. So... The question then is, I have to say that when I heard about this as a small child, I was extremely excited about the prospect of us as a species making contact with an alien civilization. However, as time has passed, um, and I now most definitely have a different opinion on the subject, the only history stroke track record that we have to look at to find out what has happened when two civilizations of two different levels of technological advancement meet is what has happened on our own planet. And almost invariably, it has not worked out well for a less technolog technologically advanced civilization. And this is what concerns me, I have to say. It really does. Um, if an extraterrestrial civilization was to net technologically advanced enough to be able to travel to Mars and deliver what has to be a payload of thermonu thermonuclear weapons of a sufficient power to be able to destroy Mars' entire biosphere and every living thing on its surface. And given what we know about our solar system, then it seems highly unlikely that it came from within our solar system. It could have done. I'm not saying it didn't, but it seems unlikely. Then who is to say that they wouldn't think twice about doing something similar like that again and that we wouldn't be the next victims? And to be honest, the evidence that Mars suffered a massive nuclear thermonuclear attack in a region of the planet which seems to have had a humanoid culture similar to the ones we had on Earth 
which we would know as being ancient Egyptian or Mayan, seems to be overwhelming. And the fact that we have no idea who attacked Mars, where they came from, and why they did it, I personally, I'm finding terrifying. So, so as a consequence, um, I would urge the relevant authorities to do the following immediately. Stop broadcasting radio signals into space as part of the SETI program immediately. SETI, in my opinion, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, should concentrate all its efforts into listening for evidence of extraterrestrial civilizations instead of trying to make contact with them ourselves. Work on developing a plan to put a strategy into place of how to defend ourselves from an extraterrestrial civilization um, determined to wipe us off the map and find a way to stop our human made radio signals and lights leaking into space. So let us consider our radio signals traveling through space and the time it takes for those radio signals to reach the nearest planet to us outside of our solar system. So, currently modern science believes that the nearest planet to us, which is outside of our solar system, is Proxima Centauri b, which is a rocky planet in the habitable zone of its host star Proxima, Proxima Centauri which is approximately 4.25 light years or um, all those. <laughs> I'm not going to even attempt to read that out, but that number that you can see there on the screen is how many kilometers it is from Earth. That is just an astronomical number. It is. It really is incredible um, from Earth which means that it would take us traveling in a spaceship, traveling at the speed of light, 4.25 years to reach Proxima Centauri B. Now, remember that light travels at um, travels at, uh, here we go, don't laugh too much, 9454254, nine five five four eight eight zero 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 kilometers in one year and for the purposes of context the earth is approximately a hundred a hundred and fifty million kilometers from the sun and mars is approximately two hundred million seven hundred and twenty two thousand six hundred and sixty six hundred and forty six kilometers from earth so, also, how about where we came from? Is there a discussion point here in relation to where we as a species came from and how we came into being? In the Pink Floyd song, Keep Talking, at the beginning of the song, there is a sample of the late, great Professor Stephen Hawking. This sample contains an excerpt from a speech he gave about the origins of humanity and he said, for millions of years, mankind lived just like the animals. And then something happened which unleashed the power of our imagination. We learned to talk. Now, for me, the interesting bit of what Professor Stephen Hawking says here is when he talks about human beings living like animals, and then something happened which unleashed the power of our imagination because it is well known that scientists and no one else that matter has been able to provide an explanation as to why suddenly 60,000 years ago, after a million years of little or no evolution, evolutionary development, suddenly out of the blue, humans took a huge evolutionary leap forward. But what was it that caused this huge evolutionary leap forward? The answer to that question is that no one really seems to know. Um, so were we influenced or did we have our DNA manipulated by some other unknown force no one knows 
However, all we do know is that 60,000 years ago, for some unknown reason, that the human species, after millions of years of unremarkable development, suddenly took a huge evolutionary step forward. It is possible that huge evolution that huge ev evolutionary jump forward was a consequence of refugees from Mars. However, I'm not 100% convinced, although it is possible. But as you may remember, Dr. Brandenburg felt that the civilization of Mars was likely very primitive, which, if it was the case, would mean that it would not have mastered the art of space travel let alone the art of DNA manipulation. So it may be that we have to look elsewhere for the culprits. So at the time of Marcy's nuclear holocaust, which if we accept Dr. Brandenburg's hypothesis was 180 million years ago, Earth was in the middle of the Jurassic period, which was at a time when the Earth, at the time on Earth when human beings had not yet has sprung forward. According to mainstream science, and the Earth was dominated by the dinosaurs. So certainly not a safe environment for human beings to live and start a new life in. So, however, there are those on the fringe of the scientific community who believe that this may not be strictly true, and they point to a hypothesis known as out-of-place artefacts. This hypothesis argues that there is a growing amount of artefacts being discovered which do not appear to fit in with the accepted historical timelines of the emergence and development of human beings on this planet. One of the leading proponents of the out-of-place artefacts hypothesis is a guy by the name of Michael Cremo, who you can see there in the picture. Um, Modern science believes that ancestors of modern humans, such as uh, Australopithecus and hum Homo erectus, came into being around circa 200,000 years ago, and yet fossilized remains of what appear to be human footprints next to what appear to be dinosaur footprints have been discovered. One such discovery was known as the Paloxi River case, which became famous for controversy in the early 1930s, when locals found dinosaur and supposed human footprints in the same rock layer in the Glen Rose Formation. And these were widely publicized as evidence against the geological timescales that we'd been given. So before we move on, I'm just going to go into the chat again. Um, Joanne's come into the chat and she's going, I'm going to watch some Planet programs later. Well, fair play to you, Joanne. I hope you enjoy them. And Jaminio is in the chat. He says, hello, Warren. Hi, Jaminio. Nice to see you, mate. I hope you're good, buddy. I hope you're having a great evening and that you're enjoying the show. So, make sure you subscribe to Diesel's channel if you haven't done it already. And also, please make sure that you do the same um, for my channel, Warren's Team Talk. Please make sure you put a like on this video. Uh, like I say, make sure you subscribe to his channel. And also make sure that you do put like on any video of mine that you watch and make sure that you share our content around. That would be most appreciated. Thank you very much, guys. And um, so another example of these out-of-place artifacts um, and one of the most puzzling discoveries which fits into this category are the clerk's dork spheres, which you can see a couple of them there in the image. These are spheres which have been discovered in South Africa and they're reputedly between two and three billion years old and they range in size from less than one centimetre to ten centimetres across and they appear to have three parallel lines 
uh, groups running around the equator. But the big problem is that they have been dated at between two and three billion years old, which is at a time when modern science claims that Earth was far too young to host intelligent life. And so the big question with these spheres are, what are they? What are they? What were they used for? Who made them? Where did the civilization who made them come from? And where did they go? And what happened to that civilization? The honest answer to all these questions is that no one really knows. But one thing is for sure, they are a massive mystery. And that it seems that they're the only thing we do know is they do appear to be between two and three billion years um, old. It's an interesting to note as well that the ancient builder race that I was talking about earlier um, was originally uh, allegedly around circa two billion years ago. And so the question for me is, were these spheres created by the ancient builder race and did this ancient builder race play a role in the disruption of Mars? So Mars and the ancient Egypt connection, because many believe that there is a connection. There is an interesting theory that connects the face on Mars with the Sphinx of ancient Egypt, which I thought, first saw about five years ago now when I stumbled upon a YouTube video of a presentation by Richard C. Hoagland, who I was talking about earlier, who is best known for his theories on advanced civilizations, colonizing the, uh, the solar system and calling out the alleged corruption in NASA and the US government. And he is also the author of the best-selling book, The Monument of Mars, A City on the Edge of Forever. In this presentation, he showed how the face of Mars with a few folds of paper that he had a picture of the face of Mars on, turned it into the face of a lion, and then he compared it with the great sphinx of Egypt. So firstly, in ancient Egypt, lions were considered to be the guardians of sacred places. So the great sphinx of Egypt, the sphinx is a massive part man, part lion sculpture located near Cairo in Egypt. And strangely enough, Cairo means Mars. Now, as we, as we have seen, thanks to the work of Graham Hob Hancock, Robert Schock, and a few others, the evidence now is overwhelming that the Sphinx should be dated to at least 12,000 years ago. Um, so here we can see a side view of the Sphinx. And if you look at the Sphinx, it clearly has the body of a lion uh, with a human head. And Graham Hancock and Robert Schock, who is a professor at Boston University in the United States, have proved that it is thousands of years older than the accepted mainstream dating of the Sphinx. Robert Schock, who is a geologist, has gone on record as saying that within five minutes of looking at the Sphinx, he knew that it had been subject to water erosion. And the last time that Egypt had a climate would have, that would enable water erosion of the type that the Sphinx had been subject to was circa 12,000 years ago. It should also be noted that the Sphinx of Egypt is facing the horizon. So now, as you can see, there, there's the front pause of the of the sphinx at the front there and then if you look at the back you can see a tail and then there's also the main body and clearly it is um a lion laying down on its haunches now let's move forward so it's also interesting to note that we will at the end of this current century, moving to the age of Aquarius, the water carrier, and at dawn on the spring equinox, the Sphinx will be facing the constellation of Aquarius as it comes up over the horizon. And even more interesting, 
interestingly, the date with the, that the Sphinx would have faced the constellation of Leo, the lion, at dawn on the spring equinox would have been 12,000 years ago, 10,500 BC. Graham Hancock and Robert DeVal are convinced that the Sphinx was originally carved 12,000 years ago as a lion, and at that time would be circa, which would be circa 10,500 BC, was the age of Leo, the lion. And then its face was recarved, so they had a human head with the face of the Pharaoh King Khafre um, in approximately 2500 BC. As part of the work that Graham Hancock did in Egypt, he was able to show that the Great Pyramid and its two counterparts in the Giza Pyramid complex are a mirror of the belt Orion in the constellation of Orion during 10,500 BC, which is exactly the same time when the Sphinx is facing the constellation of Leo on the horizon at sunrise during the spring equinox. So therefore, it's clear that the pyramid builders and the builders of the Sphinx were trying to tell us something um, from down the epochs. So if we accept the face of Mars as a line encoded into it, then it is clear that there is a connection between the face of Mars and the Sphinx of Egypt. So, so what does this mean for us on Earth, right? There appears to be a remarkable similarities between the structures that have been found on Mars and those which are on our own planet. And it has also been suggested that there are other pyramid, pyramidal structures throughout our solar system. For example, on the dark side of the moon, where the structures it's claimed also had a written language on them, which was similar to ancient Egyptian and Mayan, but not the same. And in almost, almost every continent on Earth, there are various ancient structures, which most are pyramidal, pyramidal in nature. Arguably the most famous of these are those which can be found in Egypt and Central and South America. So the images of pyramids in Egypt and the Americas but in addition to these structures on Mars and Earth, there have been reports and allegations of structures have been found on the dark side of our moon and throughout the rest of our solar system, including the moons of Jupiter and Saturn. Um, so, yeah, there's an image of the um, pyramid there in Latin America. And there, there has also been alleged that there is a huge monolith on the Martian moon of Phobos. So here it seems that we have seen, so here it seems that we have yet more evidence of a common ancestor for these ancient artifacts. Because if it isn't, then how is it that different cultures with no knowledge of each other on either on different parts of the same planet or millions of miles apart in the cosmos, completely separately, independently and randomly come up with such similar, if not exactly the same structures, unless they inherit, the, inherit the, these ideas from the same source. So let's quickly go to the chat. Um, Joanne says, Oh, Egypt, another subject I'm interested in. Yeah, Joanne, and I will be talking about the pyramids and stuff in a future show. Um, also, Lapis Lazuli is my favorite crystal which Cleopatra used for eyeliner and shadow. They used to crush it down to make powder. Now, I didn't know that. That's interesting. And Neandra's saying Chelsea-Liverpool, boring match. Well, there you go. Don't watch that. Watch this instead. <laughs> Far more interesting. Um, so now I want to talk about the Fermi Paradox. 
and my thoughts on what the answer to this paradox is. So I'm going to give you some interesting facts now about our galaxy as well. Our galaxy is an average size galaxy, and there are some which are bigger and some which are smaller. Our galaxy has 400 billion stars in it, and it takes 100,000 years for light to cross our galaxy. This means that in order to travel from one side of the galaxy to the other, if you were in a spaceship that could travel at the speed of light, it would take you 100,000 years to cross from one side to the other. This means also that if just one-fifth of the star systems in our galaxy had habitable planets orbiting them, and, then, and if just 10% of them had advanced civilizations, this would mean that our galaxy would be home to 8 million advanced civilizations, which is slightly more than there are people on planet Earth. There are two trillion galaxies in the part of the universe which we can see from our planet, which is just a small part, by the way. And if all these galaxies have the same number of advanced civilizations in them as our own, then the number of civilizations that we can see from our planet is not a number that can be expressed by any human, hang uni any human language as it is way too big which I find absolutely staggering, to be honest. Um, as discussed earlier, the Fermi paradox can be des best described as the unexpected silence of the cosmos and the discrepancy between the lack of conclusive evidence of advanced extraterrestrial, li extraterrestrial life compared to the apparently high likelihood of ex its existence. As a, 200, a 2015 article put it, if life is so easy, someone from somewhere else must have come calling by now. The principle has been taken to suggest there is nothing very unusual about the evolution of our solar system, Earth's history, the evolution of biological complexity, human evolution or any one nation, in a cosmos known to have abundant planets and life precursor chemicals. I have to say that I do not believe for one minute that there is a paradox at all. And I believe that it's a smokescreen used by mainstream science on instruction from the world's governments to hoodwink the general population and to believe in there is nothing in the cosmos other than us. I think it's highly likely that the answer to the Fermi paradox is very simple and there's a variety of explanations to it which are many and varied and could be one of the following or a combination of any of the following, if not all of them. And these are, one, that our governments know of the existence um, of a multitude of extraterrestrial civilization and is in contact with them and have been following a policy of denial and cover-up since the beginning of since the beginning for a whole multitude of reasons. The other civilizations in the cosmos are aware of the true nature of the universe and do not want to draw attention to their existence so that they do not suffer the same fate as Mars and the mythical fifth planet did by broadcasting signals into the cosmos or communicating with civilizations that they receive a message from. None of the, none of other than the late great Professor Stephen um, Hawking went on record as warning of the dangers of communicating with an extraterrestrial civilization who we know nothing about. That other advanced civilizations in the universe look upon us as being highly dangerous and volatile, uh, so do not want to communicate with us just in case we wreak havoc and devastation upon them and the same they, that we do to each other. That the other advanced civilization and civilizations in the cosmos 
are doing one of the following with us waiting for us to advance sufficiently so that we are no longer a danger to ourselves or the rest of the cosmos helping us to advance emotionally technologically and spiritually in the background so that we can so that we can be trusted to take our place in the cosmic community because at present there seems to be a widespread belief that we wouldn't be able to handle the truth for example the world's governments came out and admitted that we are not alone in this universe and never have been and the world's governments have been lying to us and pursuing policies of denial and cover-ups for generations then the whole fabric of society would fall apart and because it wouldn't mean that all the pillars that our societies are built on are built on lies and would collapse that the more advanced civilizations in the universe have been using our planet as a laboratory and if this is the case it will explain all the cases of alien abductions and bloodless and trackless animal mutilations especially in cattle and why would an advanced alien civilization want to have anything to do with a violent suicidal adolescent civilization which is on the edge of a galaxy and it seems on hell bent on self-destruction and that they are not going to learn anything from or that they are just not going to benefit from being in contact with so what are my thoughts about all of this so i believe that there are serious mi missing gaps in what we've been told about our past where we came from and that the whole basis of what we base our societies and cultures on this planet are the misunderstood half-truths at, at best or at worst just blatant lies destined to control us um, and keep the power brokers who have been controlling affairs on this planet since time began in power. And I believe that this is why our governments are so terrified to come out and tell us the truth about our past, where we came from, because if they did, the whole fabric of our societies would fall apart. So before we move on, let's uh, go into this a bit more. Into, sorry, into the chat, sorry. Uh... Giant says, I'm going to go to I'm going to go to a pyramid at Bicklin in the summer. Well, fair play to you, Joanne. I hope you enjoy it. And uh, Naranda says, images we see from Earth with telescopes are images of the past that happen that light has taken hundreds of thousands of years to get to us at the point of viewing in current time that galaxy has changed exactly that is my point that is it in a nutshell so what you when you're looking up in the sky what you're actually doing is you're looking back in time so and don't forget what i said earlier the nearest star to us is 4.2 light years away that means that it takes 4.25 years for the light to travel from that star to us so the light that you're seeing from the star which is nearest to us when you're looking up in the sky is the light that left that star 4.25 years ago all right so yeah you're 100 percent right naranda um joanne says i will take some videos when i go for you thank you joanne right okay so let's move on Please, everyone, make sure you go and subscribe to this man, this absolute legend that is Diesel. Subscribe to his channel. Make sure you hit that like button on any videos that you watch. If you haven't subscribed already, then you need to be examined. <laughs> I'm joking. But if you haven't subscribed already, please make sure you do. I'm sure that you won't regret it. It's an absolutely brilliant channel. He talks all about all sorts of different things, life in general, TV. He has me coming on doing talks about paranormal 
um, things. Uh, I recently did a, a video about the death of Princess Diana, um, whether it was murder, whether it was a horrible accident. Go and check that out as well. Um, also, please make sure you share the content around for us and please make sure you do the same for me. Make sure you subscribe to my channel. Make sure that you check me out on Instagram and Twitter and things like that. Just do a search for me by doing Warren's Team Talk. Um, every Saturday I'll do a show at half past two on a Saturday, which keeps you up to date with the scores in the football up and down the UK. So, yeah, come and check me out. I'll be doing another show on Saturday. Not about paranormal, though, about football. Um, so, um, what I discussed. So, tonight, um, we've looked at um, whether Earth was the only planet that has ever been capable of housing life, what the Goldilocks zone was. I introduced Dr. E. Brandenburg and his theory about Mars to you. Uh, we talked about Dr. Brandenburg's PhD paper. We looked at the approximate locations on Mars of the nuclear explosions. We talked about those explosions. We looked at the anonymous structures on Mars, about whether Earth should contact ET, how can we can defend ourselves if we need to, uh, where we came from, the Mars and ancient Egypt connection, Fermi's paradox, and we also looked at what my thoughts on the matter were. So that's the end of the show, guys. I hope you've really enjoyed it. Um, remember, as Stephen Hawking says, keep your eyes on the skies. And I'm just going to read this little bit to end the show on for you. And it's a quote from Stephen Hawking, and he says, for millions of years, mankind lived just like the animals, then something happened which unleashed the power of our imagination. We learned to talk and we learned to listen. Speech has allowed the communication of ideas, enabling human beings to work together to build the impossible. Mankind's greatest achievements have come about by talking and its greatest failures by not talking. It doesn't have to be like this. Our greatest hopes have become reality in the future with the technology at our disposal. The possibilities are unbounding, unbounded. All we need to do is make sure we keep talking. So fair play to Stephen Hawkins. Lovely, lovely words there. Um, make sure that you take care of yourselves. Thanks ever so much for watching. Don't forget to put a like on the video. Please subscribe to Diesel's channel and my channel and make sure, sure you share the content around. Please, please make sure you take care of yourselves, your friends, your families, your loved ones. And please, guys, make sure you share some love and kindness around the world. Thanks for watching, guys. Take care. Have a lovely rest of the evening. And... And there's just one more chat I want to highlight on if two actually. Um, full moon on the 6th of April, although it's out tonight. And um, that was from Joanne. And Naranda says, moon was beautiful at 7 p.m. There you go. The moon was smiling on us. Thanks very much for, what, much for watching, guys. Take care of yourselves. And we'll see you all again really soon, hopefully. Take care. Bye for now. Bye.